So here, the way we introduce usage of matrix, this entire session is not on image processing applications. This session is actually on two-dimensional arrays. As I said, this is a one and a half hour session. It can be broken into two pieces very easily and each of the two pieces can be converted into lecture videos of still shorter duration but retaining part one and part. The part one deal with general matrix problems such as matrix multiplication and magic square and the second part deals with processing of digital images. Second part is what I wish to discuss with you but I'll show you the glimpse of how we introduce practical utility of two-dimensional arrays. So here is a matrix multiplication problem which people understand. You can easily convince them that a simple algorithm like this will be able to solve that problem. Then you describe a magic square and you say that magic square is something where sum of elements of each of the main diagonals and the rows and columns is same, etc. It's interesting to go to Wikipedia and quote some history. For example, Chinese knew of magic squares long time ago. In India, the Buddhist monks had been working with magic squares for a very long time, etc. So this is an example of how the sum of rows, columns, etc. happen to be 15. And now you want to find out whether a given matrix is a magic square or not. Of course, it's a square matrix. We test the given matrix for being a magic square by using this formula that the required sum should be this. And then we tell them this is a program which does this, finds out the sum. Uh, you, you first input the square matrix ij, uh, all n by n elements, then you calculate that sum and then you find out whether the sums of the different rows, sums of different columns and sums of diagonals and determine whether they are all same. So there is one particular approach. It need not be the approach. People can take different approaches. That is perfectly fine with them. They can even discard the sum by after finding out the sum. They need not store the different sums in different array elements at all. You can simply find the sum and if it is same as what is required, you di discard it. The moment you find any sum which it does not match the required value, you know it's not a magic square. So this was one particular approach which was shown and then it was explained how this will work. So there, is, there was an alternate program that was shown, a slightly more efficient one where in a single nested loop you find out all these things. So for example, you find out row sum uh, by adding square i j comma jth element and you find the column sum by adding j comma ith element. So you will find the rows and columns in different order or different sequence, but eventually you will get all of them. And then you can explain that this is what will happen. This is how the program will execute, etc., etc. So these explanations are merely to ensure that students understand the squiggers when they hand execute an algorithm for a three by three matrix. They know exactly in what order, what computations are being done. So this part you can explain and give associated problems on the magic square or similar things elsewhere, okay. Uh, in one uh, session, I remember I had also introduced the notion of a sparse matrix after, after introducing it. There is another session in which we uh, try to teach students how to solve a set of simultaneous equations. So you are familiar with Runge Kutta or various methods that are used, substitution method for example, and you can indicate those algorithms. And with that kind of algorithmic representation, you can actually digress into the discussion of numerical errors that may crop up. When you subtract a very small quantity from a very large quantity, what happens? When you add a very small quantity to a large quantity, what happens? These kind of discussions can be done best in such examples when you are handling a system of simultaneous equations and trying to find out where, if the coefficients are very different uh, for, for the given system of equations, what would happen. And then you can point out to the interested students too, a plethora of books on numerical analysis. 
or the open source material on the web on the issue of errors and how to control those errors etc etc but i digress so there is a good set of problems that can be thought of associated with this kind of explanation and this could be used for both classroom discussion and giving the students as practice problems in the uh, in the labs or wherever in fact in the 10000 teachers training program we will be giving such lecture sessions and will be asking these 10000 teachers to submit a set of problems which they would like to discuss with the students to explain that concept better in a flipped classroom or otherwise now i come to the digital uh, uh, images notice that in every lecture or any place wherever you use material from some source you must cite that source uh, all of you are familiar with the creative commons license no i think you should read is just google creative commons and read the license terms the creative commons tries to permit people to use creative content such as text images etc etc as freely as is possible it is called the knowledge commons and all the material incidentally including these lectures and these interactions are going to be released under creative commons license so that anybody can benefit one of the cardinal rules of using creative commons property is to give a reference the first important requirement of creative commons license is by attribution that means i can use any material as long as i cite the reference that i have taken it from such and such place i need not tell you how plagiarism grips this country even grown up people are tempted to copy portions of submitted papers elsewhere and submit the whole thing as my own research paper how many times time and again and i am not talking about past tense in the past 5 years conferences after conferences in fact whenever we are on the pc committee the maximum time that we spend in taking a submitted paper putting it through turnitin and such software which actually compares your submission with whatever has been published elsewhere and it shows 60% match 40% match how many of you are aware of turnitin quite a few good so that means you examine either your or somebody else's submission using turnitin it's a good practice of course if i am a crooked person i might actually use turnitin to minimize the visibility of my copy <laughs> that should not be the objective now so i digress but the objective here is to say that the digital image processing session that i am going to describe of course i have written my own programs of course i have developed my own logic of explanation but the basic material on image representation and image processing comes from a wikipedia we just say wikipedia that is good enough acknowledge so then we describe a pixel as a picture element and there could be an array i use usually a blank blank slide in the classroom uh, to to show what i do is i i will leave this space here and i will actually use the tablet to draw a a rectangle or a square and i'll show how the pixels are there uh, arranged in rows and columns and each pixel would have a value commensurate with the value of light intensity then i tell them different encoding schemes for example i can use one bit to represent a, a pixel which will give me only a monochrome value black and white i can use 8 bits which will give me a gray scale i can use 24 bits which can give me red blue green etc etc so i can have over 16 million colors and it is interesting to tell people that look human eye is limited to a small range of 200 to 2000 colors only so even if there are million colors first of all actually there will not be all million colors present but there will be large number of colors present and the eye is not able to detect all of them this is a natural phenomenon anyway now here is what we tell them how the digital images are stored so they will be stored in terms of height width type of colors present and that is how many bits are to be used for reprinting each pixel and then all the pixel value so monochrome fingerprint images have small size for large images compression may be necessary 
because a 12 million pixel camera can produce 36 million bytes in an image. One, one photograph can produce 36 megabytes. Now that's a very large area. So you have tried to take a, a photograph with a modern digital camera which has a, a 8 megapixel or 4 megapixel or 6 megapixel thing. At the highest resolution, you get a very large image. But when you convert it into JPEG, it becomes smaller in size. That is because of the picture encoding that is done. These things need not be discussed in greater details, but just told to the students as a matter of interest. Invariably, you will find that majority of your students are familiar with digital images and digital photographs. Not to the extent of how they are internally reprinted, etc. But they generally have seen digital photographs on a computer or they will see after they come to your college on the net or whatever it is. So it is not a, a very difficult thing, but you give them additional information like there are several file formats and different people who are interested in knowing these formats, they can look at these and so on and so forth. Now, I come to the main crux of this particular lecture session where I try to tell them some very basic processing on any image that can be done to enhance the contrast of that image. And to that extent, I introduce the term histogram. So, for example, histogram, which is a term from statistics, and it is used to denote frequencies or count of number of times that an event or incidence occurs. The basic in, uh, the definition. But in case of images, a histogram table indicates how many times a particular value occurs in the image. To explain that, and to explain why is the histogram important, we will show them an image. So this is a sample image of 8 pixel by 8 pixel. Notice that all pixels are square, some are very dark, some are light. This is the whitest portion. But notice that no pixel is completely dark black, no pixel is completely chest white. Then I show them that the values of the pixels are like this. So this first pixel is 52, 55, 61, 66, etc. So they are numerical values. I also remind students that look for a monochrome, for a, for a uh, uh, black and white or grayscale image like this. And if I am using 8 bits to represent an image, then the maximum value can be 255, the minimum value can be 0. I suddenly notice that the maximum value here is 154 and minimum value is something like 52. That means the contrast in the picture is not good enough and that is the reason I tell them that you will see this picture in some kind of a blurred fashion. To explain this further, I tell them that from these pixel values, I can actually look at individual pixel. For example, this is the brightest thing, but its pixel value is 154. The true brightest spot could have been 255, not 154. So I observe that if I calculate the histogram values, which are shown in a table for non-zero pixels. So for example, how many times value 52 occurs? One time. 55 occurs three times, 58 occurs two times. Please note that these are not necessarily neighboring pixels. 52 may occur anywhere. These three elements of 55 may occur at different places, but histogram is merely a count of frequency. So if I do the count, I observe that the values vary between 52 and 154, and that is why I have inadequate contrast. So what do we wish to do? Then I motivate people for doing some image processing. The histogram is concentrated in a narrow range, whereas the possible values are from 0 to 255. Now, if I can stretch that histogram, if I can make that 52 to 0 and the largest value 154 to 255, but stretch it such that the stretching applies uniformly to all pixels, then I will get a contrast which is better without destroying the original. And then I say that the method to do that is through histogram equalization. This is the motivation for them that if I stretch the histogram to cover all possible values, I will get an equalized histogram. But in order to do the equalization, I need to map existing values to new values. So I, get, I must get a formula for histogram equalization. And then using that formula, I must map existing pixel value to a new pixel value as per that histogram equalization model. This is the motivation. 
How do we do that? So in order to do histogram equalization, I am required to find out the cumulative distribution function or CDF of a histogram. So CDF is nothing but cumulative values that appear say at 52, we ignore all the zero elements of course, 52 we say 1, that means up to 52 value there is one pixel. There is one pixel somewhere smaller than 52. Uh, sorry, 52 there is exactly one pixel. At 55, let me go back here, the cumulative histogram values is at 52 there is one pixel, at 55 there are three, so the cumulative at 55 will be 3 plus 1, 4. Cumulative at 58 will be 2 plus 3 plus 1, 6 plus 3, 9, plus 1, 10. So that is how you will find the cumulative values. And I explained to them that these are the cumulative distribution function, okay, which has been determined by simply adding up the elements of the histogram table in that part. Now having done that, then I introduce them to a formulation. And I tell them, it is not necessary for you to understand the mathematical derivation of histogram equalization. Those who are interested can go to Wikipedia article on this and then do a cross reference to find out how the histogram equalization formula has worked, been worked out. But at this stage, we tell the students, assume that this is the formula. How to apply this formula in your program is our requirement. You will recall the discussion that Professor Ranade had briefly yesterday, the difference between program design and algorithm design. And I think many of us often confuse between these two terms. An algorithm design will require people to figure out this equalization formula itself. A program design on the other hand will require people to figure out how to implement this formula in a program. And I would tend to agree with him that the primary objective of a first course in programming is not to teach them algorithm design, but to teach them program design. So given an algorithm, so for example, we are not teaching them the fundamentals of matrix inversion, but we are telling them this is the matrix inversion process, how do you implement it in a program? If you agree with that approach, then this is exactly what we do here. We have told them about histogram, we have told them about cumulative distributed function, and then we have said that if we wish to apply the histogram equalization, this is what we'll have to do. The equalization formula to calculate a new value for a given pixel value V is this. And the equalization formula, for example, in the given image, L is 256, M and N are 8, minimum CDF is 1, so the actual formula that we use becomes this. We are just substituting the values in this formula relevant to our email. And then we show them that if we did that, this is the CDF of 78 is 46, so a pixel value 78 will be equalized using this formula, it will go to 182. And we emphasize to people, look, what was the pixel value 78, now it has become 182, it has become larger. Clearly 154 will become 255, 52 would become 0, and that is how the image will get stressed. We calculate such new value for each pixel. So these are the pixel values after histogram equalization. And we tell people that, look, now I have a zero. Earlier there was no zero. Now I have 255. Earlier there was no 250. But these numbers have not arbitrarily come. They have come by the histogram equalization formula, which somebody has worked out for. And then we tell them, if we plot this image, it will look like this. By the time I show them this image, they have forgotten the previous image. So I typically show a slide which shows both the images side by side and ask them to compare which has better contrast. Can you see how convinced the students would be when they see these two images? That one has a better contrast, the other one has a less contrast. Then I point out that this is an artificial image. So let us take a real image. And then I go to the next image, which is this grayscale picture. You can barely see it. It is, it has nice meadows, there's some grass, some trees and so on, but the contrast is very poor. Okay. I show them that for this image, the histogram and the CDF is like this. 
So the histogram which is shown in the red is concentrated between the values 120 to 200. And this is the cumulative uh, histo uh, distribution uh, function of the histogram. Then I say I would like to stretch it like this, such that the histogram becomes like this. And the cumulative distribution function becomes like this. And if I do that, and if I apply the histogram equalization, this is the image I will get. And this image is much more visible. Again, as usual, I show them these images in, in the context. So for example, this was the original image. This had this kind of histogram and cumulative distribution function. When I equalize the histogram, this is the new histogram, and this resulted in this image. Can you see that you don't have to go through a huge image processing algorithm and introduction and so on to introduce this? And none of this material is my creation. It is available free on Wikipedia. I merely took that Wikipedia article, wrote a small program to indicate how these computations are done, motivated the students to look at this. You will appreciate that the students will definitely be more motivated by this example rather than a statistical description of cumulative distribution function and its application. Then now when I show them the program, so this is how do I calculate the entries in the histogram table because I have only pixel values. So I create an index 0 to 255 and simply use the element number itself as the pixel value and accumulate all the pixel values there. Then I show them that this is the program for histogram calculation and equalization. So I read in the image value, then I calculate the equalizer, I calculate the histogram table entries first, then I have to calculate the cumulative distribution function, I have to find out the minimum value in CDF table because that is required in that formula. You will recall that formula which had one min there. So I have to calculate the minimum and then I have to calculate the entries in the equalizer table. So these are the equalizer tables. Once I do that, I calculate entries in the new image array. The new image ij is equalizer of image i. Okay. The discussion on this, this program may take some time. But observe that the program itself is not very lengthy. It's hardly 20 lines of operative code. And in 20 lines you can do all of this. And then you can tell the students that those of you who have digital cameras or who have seen modern digital cameras, the modern digital cameras themselves have an equalizer function. So when you take a photograph, you can actually do the equalization by pressing some button. Who does that equalization there? You can then tell them about the embedded software you can tell them that a code written like this in C, C++ can be converted into an embedded software for that camera and that is precisely what some smart fellow has done. And that is exactly what you all can do. So you can even motivate them towards embedded C programming, embedded C++ programming. You need not have to waste your time while teaching programming to do that. But giving such sample indications of what other things are possible motivates the people. And I have found that invariably in every large class, there will be few students who will take in their mind to pursue a particular aspect that was discussed sometime during the class. And then subsequently they may spend a semester or two years studying that or understand. Well, that is our job, isn't it? Try to motivate people to the best of their abilities to do whatever. The last point that I wanted to mention is that this discussion I led to an image of a fingerprint. And I showed them how a black and white fingerprint will look like. There were other sessions on fingerprint analysis. There were other sessions on fingerprint comparisons. There were several sessions then on describing the other authentication technique that also resulted in large discussion on problems of huge size. 1.2 billion Indians, each Indian, you get all the 10 fingers captured. You don't actually calculate the iris, but you look at the humongous storage that is required. As compared to that, the storage required to store your name, your address, etc., etc., appears very tiny. 
You see, the text description, even as ASCII code, may amount to 200 bytes, 400 bytes or something. Here you are talking about several kilobytes per image of a, 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 a finger and such many. And then you get them and you have to classify them. And what is the hard computational problem? Every time I enroll a new Indian into the Aadhaar scheme, those fingerprints that have been captured have to compare with all existing fingerprints to ensure that the person is already not enrolled somewhere else. And I tell them how hard that problem is. The second problem I tell them, not the problem but an opportunity, is that once these fingerprints are there, then I can use the bank of fingerprints to confirm my identity. So if I go to a bank, I don't have to sign and somebody does not have to compare my signature. I just put my thumb. This time, they need not find out, the backend system need not find out who I am. Because I already claimed, I, this is my account number, this is my other number. All that the backend system has to do is to find out my stored images and compare those with the image that is being captured today. And the only response I want the authentic from the authentication system is yes, this person is Fatak or no, this person is a fake, throw him out or put him in jail. And that response can be done very quickly. Now these are practical issues which tremendously interest students. I will tell you that particular year I got some experts from the industry also to give talks on uh, uh, fingerprint analysis. I purchased fingerprint capture devices. Surprisingly, they cost only 4,000 rupees a piece. I bought four devices, put them in the lab. And batch after batch, I told people that take a photograph on a, on a camera and put your fingerprint there. And record this in a file system with different names. And now some groups will work on analyzing these, on comparing these, on storing these, and on building an application like an attendance application or building an application for authentication. So different groups work on different projects. Although we have said that project related discussion we'll do in the later session, but you can see the potential. Now this is the last point I wanted to make in this session, that whenever we discuss a topic, whether it is arrays, whether it is matrices, whether it is iterative solutions like finding out uh, roots of an equation, by uh, mid-square method or by newton raphson or whatever. Each of these discussions, if you just apply your mind a little bit and look at the associated larger problems and just tell people about those problems and tell them that, look, there is a potential to do a programming project as an extension of this. So programming project definitions in many colleges are given either arbitrarily by us teachers or we'll tell students you find out some problem. And 95% of the students find out a problem for which the solutions already exist from previous years. So they find it easy to take it, do some lipapoti and submit it. But to challenge their creative talent, you can actually think of something. Incidentally, how we tackle this problem of students looking at the previous year projects and trying to submit as their own. We had a very simple solution. We put all previous year projects in open source for those students. And we encourage students to take one of those projects. But that project documentation clearly says what has been implemented. So they have to think of some additional functionality and implement that over and above what has been written. This also encourages people to understand two important things. Reuse of existing software and modifying an existing software to extend its functionality, which is how modern programming is done. Nobody writes a 20 million line code or a 2 million line code or even 200,000 line code from scratch. Teams have built these. But each contributor could write a 2,000 line code to augment functionality of a 200,000 line. When we look at the EDX platform later, I will tell you what are the size complexity and what exactly are we trying to attempt to do that. But it is possible to introduce to our students such notions of doing larger programs as projects. It is not necessary that every project must contribute to something like 5,000, 10,000 lines of code. 
that is unrealistic and i will conclude this discussion by talking about the differences in productivity of programmers in professional life and the differences that we observe in our classroom between different programmers or different students so are you familiar with the differences in the productivity of programmers productivity of programmers is measured in the professional uh, careers by typically number of lines of code delivered by a program what is your guess on how many number of lines of delivered code is expected per programmer per day any numbers 400 500 400 to 500 400 to 500 4 to 5 lines sir delivered 4 to 5 100 times difference okay 20 300 20 do you see now that amongst the people like us who teach programming day in and day out we are ourselves not sure how exactly does the industry measure the productivity of a person 200 to 500 lines of code can be written by an individual in one day but it will not be a delivered code a delivered code is one which has been tested rigorously which has been documented properly and which meets all the algorithmic specifications and that is a much harder problem i may do it overnight in case of an emergency but i can't do it day after day after my colleague ajit divan who actually teaches algorithms he is a theory guy but vexed by the students not being able to implement a particular algorithm in one single night he wrote 2000 lines of code he is exception so people can write 200 lines of code in a day but that is not deliverable code two to five lines is too small we will get thrown out in a job if we actually deliver only five lines per but 20 to 25 lines is uncannily close to accuracy the trick is the number of lines of code that a programmer can deliver does not drastically change if the programming language changes what it means is that if i am writing assembly language code i will still be able to produce 25 to 30 lines of delivered code when i am writing c c++ if i am writing sql queries i will still not be able to write more than 25 30 lines of delivered code every what it means is that is the reason why computer science researchers strive to define develop and implement more and more expressive languages such that for doing the same thing you have to write less code because the deliverable productivity is same okay now given that 20 to 25 lines of delivered code can be given what it means is if you have about 20 working days in a month unfortunately working days are calculated by the americans so they don't count saturday sundays okay so 20 working days per month we are talking about 600 to 700 lines of delivered code if a person works full time now imagine if four students are working in a group and they are working part time for our project in our course they have four other courses to do so our expectations about the deliverable of the project should be realistic all of you would have seen batches after batches i have seen batches who turn off 5000 lines of code 6000 lines of code in some project there are some uncannily productive people so i'll comment on two things one the differences in productivity could be huge so for example if i am an average programmer and i am capable of generating 25 to 30 lines of delivered code per day over a period of sustained period of 6 months my left hand neighbor sitting in the same organization may have a productivity of 100 lines of code per day and my right hand neighbor might be able to produce only 10 lines of code the person who writes 10 lines of code per day on an average and the person who writes 100 lines of code on an average per day both get the same salary both have exactly the same qualifications on paper both have the same number of years of experience now this is a fact of life the productivity difference even amongst grown ups exist even in our students the same 
difference will be reflected. That is why when the groups are formed, if we let students choose the group, first of all, good students will try to come together. So you have to actually ensure that in every group there are a few smart students and few not very smart students. So not very smart students benefit by the smarter ones. Of course, you drag the total output of the project for that group now. There are different ways in which you can assign this work. But different groups, uh, different individuals have different productivity. How do I then evaluate? How do I give grades? Do I give grades based only on the number of lines of code that people have written? If I say that people who have written 2,000 lines of code in a group project will get an A grade, and if there is only one group, do I give B and C and D grades to all other groups? So I have to set the minimum expectation that I have. And I might award an exceptional bonus points to the students or groups who do an exceptionally good job. In my marking scheme or evaluation scheme, I must make sure that the lowest group is capable of producing an acceptable project. And that acceptable project should be the criteria for my acceptability of that project as a reasonable project. I need not give that group 10 out of 10 marks. But I need not give that group zero marks or one mark or two marks just because the number of lines of code developed by that group is the smallest. I hope you get my point. I am sure that most of you would be applying such mindset while evaluating students for their group projects. But I will tell you it is not an easy task. Every year, year after year, you will get different people, different groups and you will find Tremendous differences in productivity. And I'm not talking about understanding basic program. This is after they have all understood basic program. But their productivity will differ. And there is absolutely no problem with it. That is the reality of life. Okay. Our task should be to encourage the better programmers to solve harder problems. So I'll conclude this session by saying one of the motivations I understood very early as an important motivation for a teacher, as an objective. My objective is to ensure that every ordinary student is driven to do extraordinary work. And every extraordinary student is driven to achieve the impossible. That is how you keep pushing the envelope. And it is stages. An ordinary performing student, you first direct him or her to become an extraordinary performer. And once that student becomes an extraordinary performer, you direct him or her to become an impossible achiever. And remember, we might have a class of 60 students, but every student is an individual. And every individual student is our responsibility as a teacher. Since we can't address each individual by spending enough time with him given the class size, this is where we segregate people. We segregate people into groups or classes and so on. The laggards, as I said, and the smarter people who must be challenged with harder problems. Giving them a group project, we have consistently found a very good idea to bring out the creativity amongst the more talented and to ensure that even the laggards do at least some work which otherwise they might have. The only thing you have to guard against is the tendency amongst the student to copy paste code and submit that code. I will close this session here. Let's have some question answer uh, related to these topics and these general items. The session is open. Yeah. Uh, sir, stating the productivity of code. Uh, also, the number of source lines of code is depend on programming languages. Yes. Is it? Uh, no, it does not depend. Ah, okay. The number of lines of code you have to write to achieve a function. Uh, that right. Depend on uh, programming languages. Correct, correct. Uh, to state that point. I, yeah, I that, is correct. that is uh, correct. For example, if, if you are going to choose some languages like ADA, those assembly languages and all, you will have maximum number uh, of In code. fact, I will try and show you an example. Uh, in the string processing, I have given the class a problem of getting the comma separated field well. You are all familiar with CSV format. If you take a spreadsheet and 
store it as a CSV file format, you will get comma separated values. Okay. Now, these comma separated values may appear uncanny. The name somewhere may be longer, somewhere may be smaller. So, every field does not have a fixed length. A number 24.8 will occupy four character positions. A number 12 will occupy only two character positions. So one of the tasks that you have to do, if you want to assimilate this CSV file into a database or into your program arrays differently, say roll number, marks in quiz 1, marks in quiz 2, marks in quiz 3, name, etc., etc., then you have to identify the comma-separated fields, forget the comma, and extract some other portion. Regular expressions are commonly used to do these things at the higher level of program. In the first level of programming, what we do? So I have given a problem, I will, I will upload that problem later and I will show you uh, how some smart students have written thousand line programs correctly to handle all such comma separated values and so on. And undoubtedly it becomes a large program. However, if you use C++ standard library and if you use less, then like Python, this problem can be coded in 10 lines of code. In fact, in our course, we don't, in, we don't talk too much about object-oriented programming in the first course. Although many colleges and universities have either two courses, one course in the conventional C programming and the other in object-oriented programming. But towards the end of this course, our motivation to people to tell them how object-oriented programming is better, not because of the object-oriented programming context, but because of the existence of powerful member function libraries, powerful classes, which reduce the amount of programming that you have to do. So that is the motivation. Thank you, sir. So actually in a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, lecturing mode, we can identify the group of the students are average, some of them are not average and uh, some of them are good and some of them are very, very bad. Normally in uh, our system, we have uh, very bad students are also there. But in a flipped classroom, uh, when the student comes only, we have discussing the problems and all those things. So it is difficult. In a lecturing mode, we can understand and we can put more effort on some group. But in flipped classroom, we are not delivering the lectures in a face-to-face -face mode. How we can identify identify those students. In fact, it is the other, exactly the other way around. Our experience is that in the discussion session, we are able to identify weaker and stronger students much more easily. Because in the discussion session, I am not standing at one place. I am actually moving around. And occasionally I am coming over. And I am letting students speak. I am letting students tell a solution. So in one of the uh, discussion sessions, for example, uh, you talk about weaker students. So let me explain how I learned to handle the weaker students properly. Uh, in the after dinner sessions, when I would give lectures in Hindi, for example, they still have to write programs. So I'll give some problem on the board and I'll ask people to write some program segments. Then what I'll do is I'll arbitrarily pick up three notebooks. And on the board, I will write the three programs that these three people have written. Each of the three is wrong. They are all poor programmers. However, when I start discussion, now I will say, okay, let the whole class look at the first program. What is the error that you find? Surprisingly, the same student who has written that program says, sir, udar semicolon raya Or this variable is not properly defined. But majority of the students enjoy participating in such discussion. Because there is a uncanny human mentality. I enjoy finding out somebody else's error. <laughs> so, when the master has put up the entire program, everybody will participate. You can immediately find out which among the poorer students are relatively more engrossed or interested in program. You can immediately find out the people who don't speak at all. To such people, you can go to personally and talk to them. In a regular classroom lecture, most of the people are quiet. So it's actually not easy to find out both the better performers and poorer performers in a regular classroom. It's much more easier to find out during these interactive sessions. It all depends upon how the interactive sessions are conducted. If I convert an interactive section into another lecture, then I have not achieved anything. 
and that is the reason why majority of the thinkers all over the world are suggesting that the discussion sessions are should not be held in such a classroom setting there should be round tables okay where people should sit but it is possible to decide okay. uh, there is another administrative issue that is associated with it which i would like to tell you since we have large number of teaching assistants and i would encourage all of you and i would like you to encourage all 10000 teachers to introduce the notion of teaching assistants in the first level courses the senior students can very well do that the additional administrative thing is in such classroom discussions when we do either the tas are present or we identify the people and tell his or her ta to either pay special attention to clear the further doubts that the student may have if the student is very poor or to uh, tell them that look this guy is so smart you please ensure that he solves harder problem and use him in the class to tell other students about so that is how you expand this yeah actually sir in industry uh, why the students are uh, explored more towards programming when you are considering the academic student they are having the fear to do the programming they are doing just copy and paste why is it so uh, there is no justification except that there are marks to be obtained by doing cut and paste and in the profession they have to obtain salary by actually writing code so when i go to profession i can't cut and paste because i'll not get my salary but in sir, college i can cut and paste because i still get my marks but some employees they are getting salary from 4000 also but still they are good in programming and they oh, are more explored oh the salaries and uh, capability of the individual or salary and productivity of an individual are completely unrelated yeah please understand that is how real free market economy is like cost and price they are completely unrelated the cost of producing an ic may be 10 cents it price may be 12 cents 1 dollar 12 dollars or 50 dollars depending upon what market will pay so it's a supply and demand thing if i am in a small town and i want to stay in that small town and if there are only five company and if there are 100 people wanting to become programmers then i might have to accept that 4000 rupees salary but if i am in bay area in sunnyvale even if i am the same poor programmer i'll be minimally paid 6000 dollars for doing the same shit pot programming my programming is not improved so please uh, remove this from your mind that your programming abilities are going to be related to your salary it is not true it is not related sir but uh, why you are making the language simple so that we can motivate the student towards the programming uh the point is that the objective of the first course in programming is not to motivate all students to become programmers in the end because the students who are learning programming in the first course are going to be mechanical engineers civil engineers physicists chemists even commerce accountants they are all not going to be programmers probably only a very small percentage of them will become programmers that small percentage which become programmers in profession like joint tcs infosys or whatever whatever while a majority of them may come with a computer science or it background it is not uncommon to find good mechanical engineers civil engineers etc becoming programmers late these are the people who will take to programming as a kunnas when they are our students but for majority of our students our objective is not to convert them into professional programmers later our objective is to teach them programming so that they understand a what programming is b they are able to use that programming for their own work in their own field later that is the limited object and language is hardly a, an issue there i personally hate to use c c++ as introductory programming language all of us agree that these languages were not developed to teach programming simply in fact those of you who have seen the old timers basic and fortran in some sense were much easier to introduce but please remember that all these traditional programming languages have come from an assembly language kind of package jump instruction earlier programs used to have go tos till diestra wrote that famous paper and then structured programming evolved and it's not easy for people to understand those structures and so on so programming languages are still not meant if you ask me 
The easiest language to understand perhaps is Python. Python scripting is, is much easier. And there are courses across the world where the first course is in Python. This is possible. But we are stuck with this unless your university system changes the syllabus. You and I are forced to teach it. In IIT, we had umpteen debates that should we change this C, C++ to something better. And guess what? All other departments other than computer science departments say that no, you must continue to teach C, C++ because that is what most of our numerical algorithms are. For 20 years, these departments forced us to teach Fortran as the first programming language. So, and, and first year course is a service course given by us teachers to the students of all branches. So that common wisdom will prevail. We can't do much about it. Thank yeah. you, sir. I'm Manish Kakhani from Modi University, Rajasthan. Sir, my question is like, uh, can we use Wikipedia as an authentic source of resource in research papers and project reports? Yes, most certainly. In fact, why Wikipedia alone? You can use any printed and published material as source of research and quote that material, provided you quote it with reference. If you use Wikipedia, as long as you give Wikipedia reference, the difference between Wikipedia open source and other printed material is suppose I write a paper based on the research papers of others, as long as I quote the research paper reference, I can circulate that research paper to anyone. In Wikipedia, if I quote the Wikipedia material, People can take that Wikipedia material and extend it as long as they circulate it in open source. There's absolutely no problem. Referencing is what is important. Citation is what is important. You cannot take a Wikipedia article, five sentences, and write them as if you have written them. That is academic crime. It's not just not permitted, it's crime. Actually, uh, people in the Western societies are literally hanged for such crime. You cannot, in fact, in any place, you cannot quote even one full paragraph of any book or paper, including Wikipedia, without mentioning that this comes verbatim from such and such source. And you have to put that in double quote. That's an academic practice. There's no compromise with this. You cannot do it otherwise. In fact, I'm glad you raised this question because Majority of us will understand it, but you will agree that many of the 10,000 teachers who will come to attend our course probably will not appreciate. Because in India, all knowledge has always been considered to be freely available and freely usable by anybody. But that is not the academic practice. Yeah. In fact, in programming, what we do is sir, that we give us a problem and generally we go around in the classroom and we see that uh, different solutions. So yeah. suppose if two, three students, the same problem, they solve it with, with uh, two, three different approaches. Correct. Generally, we call them on the board and they'll ask them to write and we generally we used to compare it. Yes. So that other students also, they used to comment on that and which one has that better complexity and yes, which yes. one has that memory management, good ah, technique. Yes. All these things, generally we compare it, sir. Very good. In fact, that is an approach which actually you can do more often in a flip classroom. In a normal classroom, you are still required to give a lecture and occasionally give this problem. In a flip classroom, you can do that for the entire hour. And you can imagine how many students you can relate to. And this approach is very good. Many of us follow it, but we are able to follow it only occasionally in the regular season. Yes. Right. Good point. Okay, we'll take one last question. Yeah. Sir, good morning, sir. I am Ramohan Reddy, SV University, Tirupati, sir. Uh, is it possible to adapt ISDLC? software development lifecycle model to teach uh, the programming? Uh, I would suggest not. In fact, although in our course we'll be telling people about the elements of software engineering, to discuss the standard methodologies and to discuss even the waterfall model and the other models in the first course may quite often be counterproductive. What you can do is, you can hint to people that such material exists. And let us say, encourage people to read Pressman's book or some other book yes. or some other reference. But leave it to them. Don't make it integral part of the first course. You see, the first course is still a first course. 
Yes, sir. Uh, uh, by scaling down, sir, ha. without uh, cutting any... That is what we no normally do anyway. We don't call it SDLC. Don't we do that? We take a problem, we do some design, we do some development, we tell them to test. Sir. We tell them... That. So, we are actually doing it, but without naming it. If you use heavy names, it will confuse people. Okay. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir.